Um, and thanks again very much to, um, uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me to come here. What I want to do is I want to look at uh, the case of former Yugoslavia, which is a double transition. On the one hand, Yugoslavia was experiencing uh, at the late 80s and early 90s a transition uh, from um, an authoritarian state uh, and a sort of centralized plan uh, economy, though different from the economy of other uh, country, communist countries at that time, and of course superimposed on that was the war, uh, the wars of uh, Yugoslav uh, disintegration which added a sort of post-conflict uh, aspect. So here we are talking about sort of post-authoritarian and post-conflict uh, converging uh, uh, and, and sort of happening simultaneously. The reason why this, uh, the, the Yugoslav case I think is important and interesting is uh, first because the character of the conflict is very similar to the character of conflicts uh, that we see um, uh, in the sort of post-Cold War period. First of all, these, these conflicts tend to take place uh, in authoritarian regimes which are under pressure from globalization to liberalize uh, economically uh, or politically. Uh, the other striking feature, uh, particularly uh, you know, in the context of the Arab transitions, uh, is that democracy movements, pro-democracy movements, uh, end up uh, sort of paving the way uh, for uh, for armed conflict uh, in the former Yugoslavia uh, from the start of the of the mid uh, of the 1980s, uh, the, the, there was a, demo, a sort of thriving democracy movement, which was about reconstituting the relationship between state and society, and that movement ended up being hijacked uh, by one of the uh, of the agenda uh, of the agendas in the civil society circles, which was the nationalist agenda. So it became about reconfiguring the relationship between Belgrade and Zagreb, or Ljubljana uh, uh, and, and Belgrade, rather than uh, this very rich pro-democracy movement uh, uh, that emerged in the 80s. And some people go as far as to interpret the conflict that happened uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the early 90s um, as a conflict, as a war on civil society. In a way, that conflict was uh, a war on this democratization uh, movement which, uh, which was coming to the fore. And then the third element, which I think is very important, uh, I was struck by the comment uh, uh, by the previous speaker that uh, many of the local forces might not have uh, ideological content. I think one of the key features of contemporary wars uh, is the centrality of identity politics uh, as, as distinct and different from uh, ideological politics. And by identity politics, what I mean in effect is claims to power on the basis of one's identity, on the basis of, of labels, uh, power for Serbs or power for, for Croats, rather than uh, claiming, uh, making claims to power on the basis of a, of a vision for ordering society, an ideological uh, and, and political vision. And that was the central, absolutely central feature uh, of the war uh, in the former Yugoslavia. Now very briefly, the background of the conflict and the atrocities that have been the subject of, of transitional justice intervention interventions now for, for 20, uh, 20 years. Um, the, the wars of Yugoslav disintegration were fought primarily through ethnic cleansing uh, and attacks on civilians, uh, through terrorizing civilians and uh, large-scale human rights violations which took the form of expulsions, uh, killings, uh, torture and rape, uh, including uh, elaborate systems of torture and, and rape, uh, rape camps uh, that were set up, uh, as well as the destruction of cultural and religious uh, property. Now, Bosnia was uh, by far the most uh, devastating uh, of these wars with more than 100,000 uh, casualties, uh, but also a war where rape uh, attracted global attention as uh, a weapon uh, of war. Uh, and of course, the, uh, Europe's most, uh, 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 Europe's biggest uh, atrocity since the Second World War, Srebrenica. Uh, where 8,000 men uh, and boys were killed in the span of uh, several weeks uh, happened during that war. 
Now, the Dayton Accords brought the formal end of hostilities uh, in 1995, negotiated by the international uh, community. And here again, I think Yugoslavia is very important because it became, if you want, a uh, laboratory also for this new approach of the international community towards peace building, what is called liberal peace. And liberal peace is the combination of you know, peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peace building, so a set of security instruments. And on the other hand, democratization and marketization, sort of a mixture of, of uh, a democratic political agenda and very much a sort of neoliberal uh, uh, economic agenda that, that are seen as, 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 uh, as instruments for, for building a, a sort of liberal peace. Uh, now, there has been uh, significant transitional justice initiatives uh, in the region. Already during the conflict, in the midst of the war uh, in uh, 1993, the U.S. Security Council established the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, uh, and shortly uh, after that, a year later, it also established the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Uh, and what's interesting uh, in those tribunals is that it represented a, a radical shift in international criminal law because the Nuremberg and Tokyo Tribunal are often celebrated as the uh, sort of uh, key landmarks for the international human rights movement. But at the heart of prosecution in both Nuremberg and Tokyo was not hum were not human rights violations. The central crime, what the judges in Nuremberg said, was the supreme international crime which was different from other crimes only by incorporating within itself, they said, the accumulated evil of the whole were crimes against peace. So the underlying, the central offense, if you want, was violation of state sovereignty. And in fact, crimes against humanity, which was the way in which the Holocaust crimes were prosecuted in Nuremberg, were only third. And they could only be prosecuted in relation to other crimes in the, in the statute, which meant uh, crimes against peace or aggression uh, and, and war crimes. A very different situation in 1993, where what is attracting global attention in the context of the war uh, in Bosnia is the humanitarian aspect. It is uh, the pervasive ethnic cleansing. Uh, and so in establishing the tribunal uh, using Char uh, Charter 7, so this is explicitly framed as an instrument for maintaining uh, international peace and security uh, of the Security Council mandate. What attracts uh, attention and what is sort of at the heart of the reinvention of international justice uh, that takes place at the time is precisely uh, ethnic cleansing. So it's not the waging of a aggressive wars, it's human rights violations which are committed in the context of ethnic cleansing, reaching genocidal, uh, genocidal uh, dimensions in places like Srebrenica. So far, the Yugoslav Tribunal, which is uh, at the very end of, of its operations, has indicted 160 individuals. Um, uh, and around 30 of these indictments have, uh, have been stalled because uh, usually of the death of, of the uh, indicted individual. But so far, we have 74 convictions, uh, 18 acquittals, uh, 20 cases are pending, including some of the most important ones regarding Bosnia, uh, the Bosnian Serbs military and, and uh, political leadership. Um, Radovan Karadzic and Radko Mladic are both currently on trial uh, and these cases are, are pending. Uh, but also the, the tribunal initiated a, a policy of reverse transfer. So rather than uh, individuals being transferred from the region to the Hague for prosecution, um, a, a number of cases have been transferred from the Yugoslav tribunal for prosecution in Bosnia, uh, Croatia, uh, and Serbia, uh, and for that purpose, uh, a set of local structures have been established. Uh, so in Bosnia, we have a special war crimes chamber, which is a mixed chamber that uh, has both international and domestic staff and applies both domestic and international law. Uh, in Serbia, there is a special war crimes chamber at, as part of Belgrade uh, uh, High Court uh, and, uh, and a sort of twin chamber for, for organized crime um, uh, as well, uh, and in Croatia, four courts, four domestic courts, uh, district courts, were designated as 
special courts for uh, courts for prosecuting war crimes, and they were given extraterritorial jurisdiction, so they could take up crimes from other uh, regions in the uh, in these are Zagreb, Osijek, Split, uh, and Rijeka. So there have been uh, a substantive numbers of domestic cases. By far, the most significant contribution of domestic trials has been uh, in Bosnia, uh, and by far the most controversial uh, in terms of the politics around it. And I'll get back to it. Uh, later. Uh, in Bosnia there have been several failed attempts for official truth commissions uh, that would be national commissions frustrated uh, for a variety of reasons. There has been one commission that looks specifically at Srebrenica uh, and that was a commission with a lot of uh, established under a lot of international uh, pressure. Uh, you may know but the Dayton Police uh, uh, the Dayton Peace Accords established effectively an international protectorate uh, and uh, the high representative of the international community was key in getting you know Republika Srpska the Serbian entity of today's Bosnia to agree to that commission now when the commission published a report providing uh, what many people saw as uh, uh, certainly not complete but a level of recognition for the atrocities uh, the massacre in Srebrenica uh, the response has not been uh, very positive uh, from affected communities there was a sense that this was done under international pressure and and it did not in any way reflect a sort of politics of recognition uh, in Republika Srpska. There have been a variety of restitution and, and repara reparation measures for property, uh, for uh, disability benefits, uh, and a number of other initiatives. And although they have been uh, important, uh, I think, uh, again, on the issue of restitution and reparation, 20 years later, with uh, you know massive support from the European Union, I mean, just to put this in perspective, there are estimates that I think the statistics is that the international community has invested in Bosnia around 20 times more than what was invested uh, in the Marshall Plan, uh, uh, with the Marshall Plan in Europe after the Second World War. So you can imagine the amount of engagement and investment because this region was seen as eventually going to be integrated in Europe. It, we have seen an unprecedented level of attention uh, and support and despite that uh, these problems are, are are outstanding and similarly in relation to vetting there has been some improvement in those parts uh, of the former Yugoslavia where the international community has pushed for uh, for vetting and by vetting I mean rather than lustration uh, which is uh, a way of uh, removing or, uh, or barring access to certain public office for uh, a group of individuals because of association with a regime or criminal organization. Vetting takes an individualized approach. So in, there was recertification of the police in Bosnia where each, new, each policeman had to go through a process of vetting uh, whether or not they had uh, participated in uh, or they could have participated in human rights uh, violations. Now this is not a judicial process but it's a quasi-judicial process and, and, uh, and people are, uh, are, are sort of incorporated or not uh, in the new security structures uh, based on, uh, on, on uh, in part on this human rights vetting. In other parts however uh, as a result of the wars and, uh, uh, and the way in which the wars both in Serbia and in Bo and in Croatia uh, entrenched uh, the, the regimes of Slobodan Milosevic and, and Franjo Tuđman, what we've seen is almost reverse vetting. Over the years, these institutions have been, from these institutions, the, the, those who might be dissidents, those who might be resisting the politics, the nationalizing politics of these regimes, uh, have been removed from the judiciary, uh, from the police, and it's the wartime elites those networks that effectively prosecuted the war, that waged the war, these are the elites that are now uh, in control of state uh, institutions. Uh, uh, a very sort of recent example from Serbia, there was a, uh, the Serbian, uh, the head, the chief of staff of the Serbian armed forces is someone who was a commander uh, of Serbian forces in uh, uh, in Kosovo. Uh, a number of Yugoslav uh, of cases at the Yugoslav Tribunal have established the commission of crimes in that part of Kosovo that was under his control. Uh, and when uh, human rights organizations published the brief. Thank <laughs> you. 
uh, effectively calling for for his removal when when he was elected. Uh, this case was transferred to the to be uh, sort of considered by the war crimes chamber, and the war crimes chamber said there is not enough uh, evidence to initiate prosecution, and he remains uh, the head of the Serbian uh, armed forces. So what we see, rather than transition and sort of radical break, what we see is continuity uh, uh, in terms of the elites, but also in terms of the underlying ideologies. And now I turn to reconciliation. It is widely seen as, in, as a failure. I mean, the fact that 20 years later, after so much investment in state building and peace building, the European uh, Union still has to have uh, military forces. There is, there is still a, a much smaller, but uh, there is still a peacekeeping force in Bosnia uh, which is seen as necessary. Um, uh, there is uh, uh, also the continuing bullying, uh, particularly of uh, the elite in Republika Srpska, the Serbian entity, that whenever certain types of reforms that are politically sensitive and that challenge the interests of these in ne wartime networks, which became entrenched during the war, whenever these types of reforms, uh, constitutional reform or police reform, is put on the agenda, there is resistance from from Republika Srpska uh, and its leadership, uh, and there are threats that, uh, that Republika Srpska will once again uh, try to secede. So the, the state is kept sort of in a permanent state of, uh, of instability. Uh, in, in fact, we, what we might be seeing in many cases is regression. I mean, when you, when you ask people uh, from an earlier generation about the war in Bosnia, why was the war so brutal? They said, well, the war was so brutal because we didn't hate each other. The extremist nationalist groups had to create these, these mutually exclusive identities by using, by using force. They had to break up communities. I mean, Bosnia, where the war was most vicious, was also the part of former Yugoslavia with the highest percent of intermarriage between ethnic groups, 25%. And so, we, we, you know, that older generation has a very different interpretation of the war often uh, and, and the violence. Younger people have been socialized in a very different environment. So in Bosnia we have the, this phenomenon of two schools under one roof, where in the same school building, Serbian, for example, and, uh, and Bosnian Muslim students will be learning to different history curricula and effectively learning that po opposed uh, 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 competing and conflicting narratives uh, of, of the war. Now, what are the problems with reconciliation? One of the issues is, of course, the term itself. There is, a, in the context of Bosnia, the term reconciliation is very problematic because the term as, assumes that the, those that need to be reconciled are ethnic communities. It is framed in inter-ethnic terms, and therefore, it ends up feeding the nationalist narratives. It, it ends up legitimizing those extremist groups that try to create these mutually and manage these mutually exclusive nationalisms through the use of force, through the commission of atrocities uh, uh, in, the, in the context of pursuing ethnic cleansing. So in a way, a, a sort of inter-ethnic reconciliation reproduces this problematic framing uh, of, the, uh, of the conflict and ends up legitimating the same entrenched uh, ethnic uh, elites and their, and their wartime, wartime networks. Uh, the conflict, on the other hand, is increasingly seen uh, as uh, um, uh, in a sort of different framework. Rather than a contest of wills between two sides that might have legitimate grievances, uh, and the conflict sort of is an expression of these grievances. Uh, inc increasingly, what, what we are, uh, the way we understand the conflict is as a mutual enterprise. What one can see is that these, the ethnic elites, the nationalists, which hijack the democracy, Democratizing, uh, the democratizing movement can be seen as involved in, some, in a both political and economic mutual uh, enterprise because their claim to power depends uh, on, uh, on the existence of a radical uh, exclusivist uh, um, uh, uh, on the other side. So there is the political project of dividing up and splitting up and, and ethnically cleansing, uh, but also huge economic benefits that, that, uh, that these actors accrued both during the war 
uh, and after the war. I mean, these wars are often, in these wars, often political violence, criminal violence is very, very difficult to, to separate. Um, and so, in a way, one could argue that, uh, uh, that if one takes the mutual enterprise approach, the cardinal problem, the cardinal sin, if you want, was the Dayton Peace Agreement. Because what the Dayton Peace Agreement, which the international community negotiated and you know, continues to be celebrated as a big success because it ended the war, well, in fact, one could argue that the, the peace was a product of the locals. Ethnic cleansing had been effectively completed. Srebrenica and, and Jepa were the, the sort of last remaining parts that the, that the Bosnian Serbs wanted. Uh, and when, once they managed to overrun those, they were ready, uh, not for peace, but they were ready for international sanction of the gains of ethnic cleansing. Uh, and they needed that international sanction, and in a way Dayton provided that. Holbrook uh, was the negotiator of the international community, and, and, and he provided precisely that. He brought together the extremists, and he rewarded them de facto. How? First by providing for power sharing, uh, and a power sharing agreement which brought together these ethnic elites and their wartime networks, uh, and effectively created uh, a certain type of politics that can never be inclusive. It is exclusive by default because your political participation in the Bosnian political order after Dayton is mediated through your ethnic identity. So you can only participate in politics, in government, uh, as Serb, Croat, or Bosnian Muslim. Uh, and in fact, the discriminant, you know, from a human rights approach, this has been so problematic that the European Court of uh, Human Rights in a case involving a Roma and Armenian uh, who uh, challenged Dayton uh, on the basis that they could not uh, run for, for certain high-level positions because they were not members of the three constituent peoples of the Serbs, Croats, and Bosnian Muslims. The European Court did find, uh, did rule in their favor and found the entire constitutional order that was established by Dayton if, uh, de facto uh, in violation of uh, um, of principles of non-discrimination and in violation of the prohibition of, of ethnic, uh, ethnic discrimination. Now, in a way, what one could argue is that that also undermined the prospects for genuine justice and accountability. While, while the international community was busy setting up international courts at one level, at another level it was integrating these elites and these wartime networks further and further. So in Dayton, the key, you know, the key negotiators were the president of Serbia, uh, the Serbian leadership and the Croatian leadership, Milosevic and, and Tudjman. And so they were strengthened, these very if criminalized regimes were strengthened in both countries and of course three years after Dayton we had another wave of ethnic cleansing uh, and another uh, sort of major war which was uh, uh, Kosovo. Uh, and so in a way what one could argue is that the mutual enterprise that the war incorporated, that the war involved, this mixture of political and economic interests that converged in the politics uh, and the pursuit of, of, of ethnic cleansing, of exclusivist nationalism. The mutual enterprise of the war became entrenched in the very political order and constitutional order uh, with Dayton. Are there any alternatives? And I'll, I'll end on, uh, on this note. Well, I think alternatives have to be thought of as moving away from the ethnic framing and from the entrenchment and legitimation of, of the ethnic elites and, and their wartime networks. And there has been, uh, because any type of legitimation, even just the term reconciliation, as long as it invokes this inter-ethnic framing of the conflict and what the underlying problem is, uh, in a way, inevitably ends up legitimating and strengthening both the elites and their criminal enterprises and uh, the, the mutually exclusive nationalisms uh, in the region. So one very, very interesting and, and in my view very promising alternative is in effect an alternative types of politics. Uh, and it's uh, an alternative politics that is coming from the, from the bottom up and that uses transitional justice and and, and sort of recognition of, of the atrocities and abuses that were committed uh, as a way 
of thinking about and, and opening up space for, for an alternative politics. And here I refer to the RECOM initiative. Uh, the RECOM initiative is a regional civil society initiative uh, um, in the former Yugoslavia, which uh, effectively demands from the states in the region to create a regional Truth Commission. Um, there have been huge problems for transitional justice in the former Yugoslavia because unlike other transitions that are happening as a result of dictatorships, here the conflict was effectively regional and transnational. So for every type of transitional justice mechanism, whether it's a trial or reparation case, you, ha you have the situation that victims, perpetrators, witnesses and evidence are often on different sides of today's border. Orders. And so when uh, often transitional justice measures that are nationally framed also end up reproducing this problematic, uh, this problematic sort of limited approach to justice and accountability. So what they, these groups demand, uh, it's, a, it's a civil society initiative that has gained momentum. They want a fact-finding de facto inquiry. They want a regional truth commission to establish the, fact, uh, the facts of what happened on the territory of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, uh, between 1991, uh, the start uh, of the hostilities uh, uh, in Croatia and Bosnia in 2001 when the last conflict, Macedonia, um, the hostilities in the last conflict ended. Now they have really energized civil, civil society because their approach to this has been regional consultations. Um, there have been consultations uh, with uh, civil society groups, with youth groups, women's groups, with victims and effective, uh, affected communities. More than 100 consultations that produced in the end uh, a statute that the civil society initiative proposed, a statute for the regional uh, commission, and they have now taken their demands to uh, the regional uh, governments uh, with, uh, with the demand for the governments to establish a, a, a public. Uh, so this is not about civil society creating its own parallel mechanism. The demand is that the regional government set up a regional truth commission in which they all uh, participate uh, as co-founders. Uh, it also suggests, uh, it also energizes sort of the discussion about the past in the region because one of the outcomes of the wars, the wars created in the former Yugoslavia a patchwork of ethnic states, entities within states, and then enclaves within, within states. And so what this has done in a way, it has provided also a platform for an alternative language. And the, it's interesting to see their approach to reconciliation. They see it as very much based on recognition of the atrocities, the human rights abuses that were committed. Recognition and establishing the facts which have been hugely manipulated uh, in the Yugoslav context. Uh, the facts from the Second World War, for example, were manipulated in the 80s and, and early 90s in a way in which scholars of that region said there was a verbal civil war. People contesting the numbers and figures about uh, how many atrocities and how many people died on different sides of the conflict. In the Second World War. That was one of the main ways in which the nationalist forces managed to sort of make their claim to power. Uh, and so the verbal civil war, this calculus of death in the 90s, is the big lesson of, of uh, for, certainly for civil society in Yugoslavia. These unaddressed grievances and, and uh, facts that are, that are not established and open themselves up to manipulation. This verbal civil war, in a way, paved the way for the real civil war that engulf the country. So they want a, a sort of a commission to establish the facts about the atrocities, about, about what, what happened. And it is also, uh, in a way, is uh, a model of, of a different type of inclusive politics because the inclusive politics in the Balkan context, which has fed into and reinforced the power of these predatory ethnic elites, has always been about inclusive on an inter-ethnic basis. And the moment you adopt the inter-ethnic approach and the inter-ethnic basis, the moment you reassign individuals into ethnic communities, you end up legitimating the same actors and you end up reinforcing the, the exclusivist politics which you're trying to, uh, to challenge. And I think this individualized approach, this, this, the framework of, of establishing 
uh, the facts of what happened through the prism of the victims uh, uh, of, of human rights violation uh, is one promising uh, direction for, for civil society and for politics in the region to go uh, beyond uh, the limits of, of the current politics of, of, of exclusion but also of inclusion. And I think I'll, I'll stop there.